following circuit really around is exhausting. He's fast and dynamic and moves quickly and walks ahead of his entourage and strides down the street and talks fast and eats fast. It's very unclear what's going to be happening during that day at the beginning of the day or in the middle of the day or even at the end of the day. Arguments and ideas sort of tumble out of his mouth. This will be like main uh, patrol police headquarters. There's this kind of energy and dynamic that's clearly sort of restless energy. He's not patient, doesn't like sitting still, doesn't like being in one place. It's quite intoxicating to be around and it's quite exciting and it's dynamic and challenging and full of energy. But it also, because it's quite unplanned, sometimes it's not always coherent. Well, how many uh, jobs does it count? Well, uh, yeah, well, now for world, like in a country which now might lose 100,000 jobs, we, we might get approximately, I think, 50,000 jobs for the next weeks to come, uh, no, next three or four months to come for this kind of things. Anyway. Okay. The circus really looks towards the American political model in terms of how you spin stuff, how you organize public relations, how you present yourself to the Georgians and to the world. Come to Georgia, a country at the crossroads of Europe and Asia. Georgia, situated on the beautiful Black Sea, a diverse country that welcomes many religions and ethnicities, even those separatists in South Ossetia and Abkhazia. Georgia, famous for its wine, its churches, and an oil pipeline that will soon supply energy to Europe. Georgia, emerging from 200 years of Russian occupation, and now a beacon of liberty in the post-Soviet space. Georgia, our northern neighbours still give us trouble, but we maintain a strong military and economic alliance with the United States. Georgia may also soon become a new member of NATO. Georgia, independent for just two decades. Here, politics is a contact sport. So come to Georgia and watch Democracy in Action. Georgian internal politics has been turbulent from the beginning, uh, including the transition from Soviet Georgia to independent Georgia. All Georgian leaders came to power illegally as a result of revolution or, you know, or coups. And Georgian President Saakashvili came to power also as a result of revolution. Saakashvili came to New York in the early 90s, worked for a New York law firm. I think he spent quite a lot of time sort of looking around seeing what works here, what doesn't work, what's good, what do I like. When Sarkis really first went back to Georgia, he was an ambitious politician and he was persuaded that Shevardnadze's ruling party was the place to be. It was the only kind of game in town, really. <laughs> Times were really tough. A flatlined economy, the municipal heat had been turned off, the electricity supply was down to three or four hours a day in the winter. That regime never, under Edward Shevardnadze, was successful. Economic reform, in fact, slid into economic decline, reinforced by deepening corruption. <laughs> I think it quickly became clear to Sarkis really there was no way he could get through the kind of swampiness of the old guard that were corrupt around Shevardnadze. Georgia was one of the most corrupt countries among the post-Soviet states until that generated a revolution. It so happened that I arrived here on November 2nd, uh, 2003, uh, and a few days later the revolution had started. Was the revolution a surprise? Revolution <laughs> 
For me, as for the very big majority of the Georgian people, it was uh, full of hopes, and of hopes of finally achieving uh, the long road after the independence uh, of uh, constructing uh, a democratic European-type model state. <laughs> I'm grateful for to Shevardnadze for bringing me and together with my friends into the government. And you know, there was there were several years with us and Shevardnadze when he basically uh, was helpful. The problem is that you know he was part of the system. He was around for too long. The Bush administration embraced uh, those who made the Rose Revolution, not merely uh, Mikhail Saakashvili, but the entire cast that had made that revolution, in part because it fit very much with what they desperately needed at that point, a democratic success. Remember the Rose Revolutions in November of 2003. In March of 2003, the United States went to war in Iraq in order to bring democracy and got itself into a lot of trouble in doing it. So they embraced the Rose Revolution as indeed a democratic breakthrough. And George Bush personally embraced the regime gives a major speech in Tbilisi in a way that he wasn't able to with that kind of warm, enthusiastic reception anyplace else in the world. Your courage is inspiring democratic reformers and sending a message that echoes across the world. And the Georgians named the main highway from the airport to the city after him. Sakishvili was born in Tbilisi. His uh, mother was a university professor, his father is a doctor. So well educated, but not the upper apparatchik class. He grew up, I think, with a sense that this was not fair, that he was excluded from the privileges and the, the way that society was politically organized was wrong. What? just got potty trained, so we're very proud. Oh. <laughs> New boat he got today. Yes, so we know the neighbors and we bring the kids to school and try to get them in time to sport. It's like citrus fruit. Oh, sure. Pay for it, like citrus fruit. You see what I found? Full of vitamins. <laughs> female breast inspection. T-shirt I brought for one of, uh, of the doctors who is head of the breast uh, screen centre. How often do you get to uh, spend time all together as a family? Once, once a week maybe. Yeah. You can uh, show us where the family relaxes or... <laughs> relaxes? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, we we don't didn't know. even have time in this one year to lit the fire. Oh, yeah. Can you imagine? Yeah, never lit we the never have, we are never home well, like half a there, day. Um, grammar. Yes. 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 Yes.
Mikus, a pavrátis. Okay, anyway, I have to rush because I have another meeting. But uh, we'll so see you at um, uh, 8.30 at yeah. our foreign minister's place. His first months were very dramatic. Well, there was a huge amount of excitement, so he had a huge amount of political capital. There was hope and a future where there had really not been, there had just been endurance. I remember days when I was still in Georgia and we had electricity only a few hours a day and water only a few hours a day. You couldn't walk on the streets. Um, now I'm freely walking on the streets, going, going to the cafes and hanging out with my friends and um, just enjoying life like I did in the U.S. There was so much stuff going on here, so much progress after the revolution. Lots of investments, lots of developments, job opportunities. We built more schools, more roads, more hospitals in this country for the last four years that have been built for 30 years before that, including the Soviet period. We were trying to build a modern European democratic civilized state. And it was electricity. So I could really, you know, great legacy will be turning the lights on. And then there was a first step towards the NATO and the train and equip program from the United States to really train and build the Georgian army. There was a very good beginning of the reforms that uh, was uh, initiated by his team, like anti-corruption uh, efforts within the law enforcement agencies. Basically 80 to 90 percent of all policemen were Fired. Then we had the new guys recruited. The naysayers would say, you can't just fire the police force, what will happen? And he just did it and got on with it. When I became president, we went after organized crime. Not only the economy was run by them, but I mean, the, the government was controlled to great extent. I mean, Georgia was one of the most corrupt countries in the world. Maybe now it's one of the three least corrupt countries in Europe. It was a brilliant period for this country and personally for uh, Saakashvili when he had the huge support from outside, first of all from uh, US administration, from Bush administration and also from whole democratic society in the world. It was a chance for Georgia to break away from the post-Soviet influence fully. It was long overdue that we get back our country into our hands and that's what, that's what happened on, 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 on November 2003. Most extraordinarily and lastingly, he was able to kind of retake the region of Ajara, which had been ruled by this kind of um, nutty sub-dictator called Aslan Abishidze, supported by the Russians. And he managed to sort of create and encourage a kind of mini-rose revolution in Ajara, and Aslan left, and there wasn't any violence and there wasn't any bloodshed, and that was a huge coup for Saakashvili and a genuinely sort of positive, exciting moment when it felt like the country was coming together again and that this was definitely going to be a new era. The example of the Rose Revolution of a popular Western democracy cropped up again in the Ukrainian Orange Revolution and then in Kyrgyzstan. And all of a sudden the Russians started to look around and say, hang on a second, this is threatening to us, this is getting closer, this could change um, the dynamic of the post-Soviet space. President Saakashvili and new leadership in general had a very clear message to Moscow that we want to start our relationship from the clean sheets. Uh, despite serious grievances in the past, so President Saakashvili's first visit was to Moscow, not Washington. There were moments after the Rose Revolution when the two sides tried to test the possibility of some improvement of relations. Initially, the signs of that relationship were not bad. The Russians took a step back over the issue of Ajara. They withdrew their troops from some remaining bases that they had in Georgia. But all along behind it was a deep suspicion of Saakashvili, and he in turn with real hostility toward the Russians. Certainly people who've been in the room with Saakashvili and Putin sort of described the atmosphere as being electric with hatred. But I think that it's far more to do with geopolitical things like oil and gas. The Caucasus is the natural alternative route for getting oil and gas from the Caspian region to Europe or to outside markets. The alternative route is through Russia, and the Russians have wanted to monopolize the transit of oil and gas from the entire post-Soviet space. So there is quite a pragmatic view in Moscow that they don't want to have an alternative to their very important instrument of being the main provider of energy to Europe. And as we have seen, it has been used for political reasons. This kind of is a bit more 
He's of the non-Soviet generation, and the team around him and his cabinet ministers and his government have almost all been in a similar cast. They're young, they spent time abroad, they have foreign experience, and their natural bias is towards Europe and towards America and not towards Russia. The target audience is in Europe, or it's more like uh, or, 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 Gulf? Or, or, it's everywhere. But I think it was less the issue of the American style than the Saakashvili policy of banging on the door of NATO and wanting to form a strategic alliance with the West, with America, with NATO, that pissed the Russians off. But NATO's movements eastward are provoking. Russia sees it as a threat to its national security. Many former Soviet states have become members. A powerful military bloc appearing near our borders will be perceived in Russia as a direct threat to the security of our country. Nobody can, can uh, try to uh, improve their security at the expense of the security of others. And we feel that uh, the simple mechanical expansion of NATO is, pre is precisely that. They are trying to think only in terms of uh, the security of countries uh, which are in NATO to the detriment of uh, those who stay outside. As long as Russia chooses to define the world in stark zero-sum terms and any geopolitical friendship between a country it considers in its sphere of influence and the rest of us is a loss, well, Russia will then always be missing opportunities to work collectively with us and cooperatively through NATO to enhance regional stability. Saakashvili used everything in order to show that they are front runners of democracy in the region, they are opposing Russian expansionism and authoritarianism, that's why they must be rewarded. What kind of rewards you want for NATO to come and provide territorial integrity, which means use the force to punish Russia. This is Georgian way of doing politics. Russia still does not want to accept Georgia as sovereign and independent neighbor. That's when then started all these problems. Economic embargo, terroristic acts on our territory, mandling into internal politics without success. There's no doubt they'd rather there was someone else in Tbilisi, somebody who was more malleable, who was more reasonable, who was, you know, playing their line. Tsakashvili speaks what he thinks is good for Georgia. And any politician who will defend Georgia's sovereignty will be not acceptable for Russia. Misha, he's a very talented person and he knows how to speak with American people, with European, uh, to use uh, a lot of words and to speak a lot of about the democracy, reforms, changes. But in reality, he built here the typical authoritarian uh, regime and everything is depend on one person, on the will of one person. And uh, this person is uh, uh, Misha Saakashvili. Yeah, Saakashvili. The Rose Revolution was made by three people. Nina Burjanadze is now a leading member of the opposition, and the other one of whom is now dead. Some say the architect behind Georgia's Rose Revolution. Saakashvili went on to become president and Zorab Zhivania prime minister. But in February 2005, Giovanni was found dead after what appeared to be gas poisoning. Federal Rugamudzebis Bureau's Tanam Shomlebi Chamoidnenom Daikmarun Sakartulos Prokuraturas Goris Teraktisa de Premieris Gardatsolebis Sakmebis Gamudzebis. Ochutkatsen Experta Chukufi Romulis Mirvegan Munatsolebis Arshul Sakmebis Gamudzebis Da Amouchenem Degaluk Medi Dachmarebis. An investigation was launched and experts from the FBI arrived to assist. The results backed up the conclusion of death by accidental poisoning, but doubts still remain. You had told the Washington Post that he had been assassinated. <laughs> You can ask just 10 uh, Georgian. Uh, do you believe that Joanna was murdered or it was just an uh, accident? And you can see that 9 of 10 will answer that of course he was murdered. I don't think that Joanna's death was murder. If you were going to kill somebody, there are more obvious ways to do it than gassing somebody. But it was one of those labyrinthine, dark episodes that frankly reflected not well on anybody.
Saakashvili is a very willful figure, very strong will, and uh, as a result has not suffered what he sees as fools or incompetence very easily, and he often assumes that the larger number of fools are in the opposition, and therefore he's not conducted a regime that was terribly open. There were many signals of the fact that this, what I saw to be uh, the building of a democracy was going in a very different direction. At the time, we cautioned Saakashvili that building a democracy requires more than just protests in the streets. It requires hard work and reform. And in reality, all the people around Saakashvili did deliver some remarkable reforms. Well, President Saakashvili had 90% support. From 90%, if you're building democracy, you can only go down. There's no other way, and especially if you want to have radical and painful reforms. During the last years of Shevardnadze, we had much more democratic and much more free media in Georgia than now. If we compare uh, Georgian media to Russian media, I cannot see uh, any difference. No national TV station is in Russia that is not under Kremlin control. The same we have in Georgia. We have channels which uh, 24 hours perform propaganda against uh, existing uh, authorities. There are a lot of talk shows. TV is open to uh, opposition leaders. They say whatever they want. And I believe that it's enough possibility to everyone to express his opinion. From Saakashvili, the main issue was a immediate TV station, which was last uncontrolled most influential media sources here in Georgia. Well, I told you, Cartoli, that's a cartoon of Mokala, Kevin Sachs, the Hartel, Tira, make it head quintals. Who can test that horror, Bolot, Hitler's Gan Malobashi, with the man and the horror of it? Did he matter? That's what Connie Pasuhiari Zara, Mashi Hual Modi, that Dawan Taurot Hual was a cash. Did he matter? November 7th was uh, the culmination and then explosion of growing opposition to the Saakashvili leadership. The opposition had begun to collect ten parties in an opposition group and had decided at that point to go to the streets. I happened to be in Tbilisi when that began. The demonstrations were large but very peaceful, initially handled by the city police, and it was all handled very well. The crowd was big, and in fact, it rivaled, it was even greater than the Rose Revolution crowds. And it was a mixture of people who had lost out in the reforms, people who'd lost their jobs or former policemen, also people who were genuinely frustrated with some of the kind of political excesses and autocracies and heavy handedness. It was a result of social discontent because when you conduct uh, very painful reforms, social reforms, you have to have resources to, to give people something to, to compensate their pain. But at the same time, it was very well guided and used by some leaders of the opposition. The demonstrations continued. Uh, President Saakashvili was impatient with the idea the opposition would be able to organize this kind of thing. President Saakashvili was impatient, he had reasons to be impatient, so he then brought in security forces, that was a very different story. Well, 
More than 500 people injured or, or arrested one way or the other. There were uh, beaten uh, the media people, international people. Personally, my, I was beaten two times, and uh, finally uh, I was beaten so that I take to the hospital. Arsevos, Erti Kartuli Archiobes, Transnes would wait for meeting Gersta, Othir Usuli Archiobes, the US Akatis. Yes, for us, it was more. In the evening time, special forces went to Imedi. They threw from, from the office a lot of journalists and other crews. Police entered opposition-leaning TV station Imedi TV's headquarters, live on air. Suddenly, the transmission was terminated. There is search on the third floor and all employees on the ground floor are lying with their faces down. By closing the channel, the government is violating the constitution. This means that this is a dictatorship regime. Here they are coming into the studio. I want to say thank you. I hear shouts in the control room. I hope our employees won't be injured. Here are our guests. It was destroyed. You can uh, not uh, see such an event in any democratic country. Not closed, not locked, not sealed. It was just destroyed. Police came and destroyed. He was serious about taking control of media. That was the main reason why Sakash really took this step against these protesters. Was it an overreaction to have uh, military police let's on the streets? Me, or was that no, no I, think, I, think, I think that was necessary. They, one can argue about television thing. Maybe we had like experience, it didn't look good, but ultimately this was for the sake of reform. After all of that, I did something which I think, more I look at it, you know, in some ways, it's, it's, it's a questionable decision. I mean, the both the Americans and the European let him know that the now scheduled elections, presidential elections, were a litmus test for him. He was no longer given a blank check. While the January 5th election was, in essence, consistent with most OSCE and Council of Europe commitments, and standards for democratic elections, significant challenges were revealed which need to be addressed urgently. I was the candidate from the joint opposition. I can tell you the truth that I win that election. We can argue, we do argue over the degree to which the last election was free and fair and, and adhered to international standards and uh, it would simply be false to claim that Georgia has reached a, a f level of full-fledged democracy. I think even President Saakashvili might recognize that as well. President Saakashvili now needed to prove that he was willing to lead in a democratic way if the West would continue to support his aspiration toward NATO. NATO welcomes Ukraine's and Georgia's Euro-Atlantic aspirations for membership in NATO. We agree today that these countries will become members of NATO. Georgia will become NATO member, and it's no longer a matter of if or not, it's just a matter of when and how. We do not expect easy and quick membership, but with a lot of reforms conducted in this country and with our readiness to do the rest of reforms, I'm quite sure that we are on a successful track. You go through the cycles of ups and downs, but ultimately you get really a free society. And in some ways, Georgia has become much more democratic in many ways. We have a show around the clock now on television that all the, all the time talks about me. Fine. That's my brother.
reality show is now in prime time. Right, I heard about this. What happens on the show? He just lives in prison and uh, some of the new prisoners coming in and talking about politics. Huge rating. A big hit? Huge. The protest here is uh, a form of the movie of the Mistress <laughs> Nebis Mary, how was Hazoka do it? Nebis Mary, it's every the concrete will let all will be. How long do you think you'll stay in here for? Sana Mes regime, it never Sakar to Eloshins, Halkis Hridan is sick of Horod legitimate or legitimate or Utsko Levis Hridan, the Amitomat Smokta is Gaurko Lobaro, Man died to Augusto Smolenebi, and tell him so Pluja and Oker Hundomarobish. The separatist territories were included in Georgia in the Soviet period, uh, populated by mixed peoples, Abhaz, in the case of Abhazia, Abhaz, Greeks, Armenians, Russians, uh, and of course Georgians. Historically, Abhazians, Ossetians, and Georgians had trouble coexisting. And usually, uh, Russia was playing kind of a balancing role. Sarkashvili came into office, and he still talks a lot about a united Georgia, a multi-ethnic Georgia, that the Abkhaz and the Setians would be part of. He became the hostage of his promises about the territorial integrity, and he decides that it's possible with this uh, military rhetoric, with aggressive steps, with some military operation to solve this problem. Wars never start immediately. Wars never start with a single, you know, uh, shot. You know, they have preliminary stage and they have logic. So preliminary stage for the war in August started in February 2008 after Kosovo's independence was declared. The Kosovo Declaration of Independence came as an encouragement to uh, those uh, people, those situations where uh, political movements, uh, regions uh, were and still are claiming uh, their right to independence. Вам не стыдно вообще вот европейцам вот с такими двойными стандартами подходить к решению одних и тех же вопросов в разных регионах мира? Заявляем нашим западным партнерам, если вы признаете независимость Косово, это нам дает полный карбаланш признания независимости Абхазии и Южной Сети. The Georgians believe that indeed it was a conscious Russia policy to stimulate this conflict and then to shape its outcome and subsequently to move to essentially supporting the separatists. This government, as any government that is losing uh, popularity and legitimacy, is drawn into adventure. But starting from February 2008, we witnessed the real steps made on the side of Russia to change the situation on the ground with the Russians moving first railroad troops into Abkhazia to be used for the invasion. We saw the Russians shooting down the Georgian UAV on April 20th. As we were all working in the international community to try to decrease tension through April, May, and June, the Russian government sent in combat-ready paratroopers. The Georgians showed remarkable restraint, and they faced severe provocations. Our key message to all our allies was that, look, Russians are preparing for something very bad which may happen within the upcoming months. So please, help us to stop it. Throughout that whole week in early August, there were exchanges of artillery fire. South Ossetians firing at Georgians, Georgians returning fire. Uh, the war had begun. 
violence had been escalating. Neither side were, was quite sure what was going on or what the other side was thinking or what was happening. And both sides, you know, pretty sensibly or understandably brought up reinforcements. On August 7th, when we came home, I turned on the TV and there's like, you know, fire. Then there was Saakashvili who had an official speech. At 7 p.m. Saakashvili ordered a ceasefire. At 11.30 p.m. it was all out war. So what had happened in between? Nobody knows. Saakashvili says that the Russians were moving troops and armour through the Rocky Tunnel into South Ossetia and that he thought this was a direct threat to Georgia and had to do something. The Russians said that it was a supply train bringing stuff into the peacekeepers. They were just moving through the tunnel, they had not yet attacked. So the fact remains that Georgia initiated a rocket attack on Skinvali, which is a civilian town, albeit with a Russian battalion in the middle of it. What was the Russian response to the attack on Skinvali? It was a very tough, harsh response uh, that included massive airstrikes. <laughs> When the war started, young guys were asking government to let them go and fight. Even though they knew the enemy had the kind of equipment, the kind of army that we didn't have. Mere ukwe tanke bi Rusis jari shemosuli es osebit tanda kwebodnen. Witness the terrifying aftermath of a Russian airstrike on one Georgian town. This is Gori in central Georgia outside the main conflict zone, but now a target in Russia's expanding military campaign. The came without warning, a sudden Russian advance pulling out of the town of Gori. Traveling at steady speed, they were heading on the main road south towards the Georgian capital of Tbilisi. There was such a panic, so much like false rumors that, you know, they're going to bomb the whole city and we're all going to die and stuff like that. And I got word from my own team that the Georgian defensive line had broken and that Russian tanks were on their way to downtown Tbilisi. And I worried that they were on their way to seize the presidential chancery. Is the goal of the Russian Federation to change the leadership of Georgia? The Russian foreign minister has essentially said that Georgia's president must go. Is this the position right now of the Russian government? It is our recommendation, yes. It would be good for everybody, for him, his country, and uh, the international community, if he were to go. I am deeply concerned by reports that Russian troops have moved beyond the zone of conflict, attacked the Georgian town of Gori, and are threatening the Georgia's, Georgia's capital of Tbilisi. The Russian government must reverse the course it appears to be on. And then suddenly the Russians were on the move again, the long line of vehicles snaking from the positions heading back to Gori and beyond. This was a clear show of strength from the Russians, a reminder who has the power and who doesn't. Why didn't the Russians reach Tbilisi? Well, I think, uh, I think at a certain moment, uh, first of all, it would have been a bloody mess. And then after all, they saw that their army was not as efficient as they thought it would be. And second, I think America stopped them. A significant armored column was rolling toward Tbilisi on the 11th and the 12th and that there was a speech by President Bush, and uh, shortly thereafter, the car column of armor turned around. When you uh, fight in this kind of a situation, you make sure that there is no more uh, mischief. Uh, so that's why uh, our military had to go on the territory of Georgia, uh, to make sure that uh, the reckless uh, uh, Georgian government, the reckless Georgian president, does not have the ability uh, to uh, resume their military adventure.
After days of fierce fighting, new hope for a truce between Georgia and Russia. Appearing at a press conference with French President Nicolas Sarkozy, Georgian President Mikhail Saakashvili said he had agreed to a modified version of a peace plan with Russia. Of course it was not a perfect agreement, but that's the fate of this type of quick fix. One couldn't ask Sarkozy to uh, restore what Saakashvili had destroyed. There was this big show singing about the victory and the glory of Georgia and this is disgusting because you know you lost the war you lost everything you were on your knees and Russians were killing you know burning villages there and you are having a party here for me it's one of the main characteristics of Saakashvili government whatever happens you know they come out and they say that no we are winning we are the best yeah well isn't part of the leadership keeping people together you know yeah, keeping people well, yeah i understand this but when you have lost you shouldn't say that you have won did Georgia underestimate the way that Russia was going to respond? I think in some ways, uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we even overestimated them because uh, we, uh, in some, you know, I think they, they've done minimum what they would have done, uh, provided they were not checked. And they were not checked. I think that uh, Russians decided to attack Georgia before, much before August 8th. Russia wants to recreate its sphere of influence by any cost. And they believe that this is the best moment for them to do it because American administration was already ending its, its term. So they had this last summer to attack Georgia. And I think there was uh, far from enough preemptive reaction to demonstrate to Russia a political costs which could have deterred them. That war was building from April. The great failure of the outside world was not to step in and say, look, we're getting too close, we've got to back away. If America could have stopped them from starting this, okay, the, well, it could. So the U.S. I think, I think, do enough? I think the, yeah, the intentions of Russians were misunderstood. Uh, by, the, by the Americans. And underestimated, definitely. The U.S. never underestimated Russia. We had told our Georgian friends over and over again, on, on, on the verge of being rude, uh, if you initiate armed hostilities, we will not come to your aid, we will not retrain and re-equip your military, which will be annihilated by the Russian attack. Well, there's a perception that exists that it was Georgia that started this war with Russia. Well, but this is bullshit. Listen to the Russians. They are saying, yeah, we've been preparing for war, so what? There is evidence that Russia did not merely provoke Georgia, but in fact had already crossed the border and made an incursion into Georgian territory before the war began in Zingvali. Captain Denis Sidristi of the Russian 135th Motorized Rifle Regiment also says he was ordered to the separatist capital, Singvali, before hostilities had broken out. On whose territory, on whose country, did the war take place? It was Georgian land. Aggressive, imperialistic Russia invaded Georgia. I can understand that for some people in West, uh, it could be, the plot could be too simple. They could think, oh, you know, there should be something going on. It's not that easy. Yes, it is that easy. Saakashvili knew quite well that it's a provocation. It was a trap uh, prepared by the Putin and Russian KGB to drag the Georgia in this war. Putin was really mad. You know, he stamped his foot and said, this guy should be hung by his balls. Saakashvili said to me, oh, as if he has a big enough rope. There was no choice for President Saakashvili, and it was just desperate counterattack to stop Russian invaders. And I think that uh, two or three days of resistance saved Georgia from complete disaster.
because otherwise Russians could take Tbilisi and, uh, and occupy the country. Russia was pictured as an aggressor, overusing the force, overreacting. Nobody even mentioned initially that Georgia attacked Ossetia. They just forgot that this kind of nation is there. I think it's at minimum extremely controversial to blame the country and the leader whose country was invaded, uh, who was bombarded and, and whose territory is occupied. I think he thought that if he could achieve a strategic military victory, and I think he thought Tsingvali would be that, he would be able to regain some leverage in order to force the diplomatic process. And it was a military uh, failure, and his bombardment achieved nothing. You know, it had huge consequences in terms of refugees and dead. so this is the holiday region, and the Red Army came through. And yeah, look at it. The whole thing is there. Like all these buildings. Look at this. This village we just passed. I'm going there. It was occupied by Russians for four months. They have so much space in Russia. Of I understand that they like the mountains and beaches, but you know, uh, they can come here as tourists. What's the strategy to get the Russians out of these territories? Is it diplomatic? Uh, Is it military? You know, uh, how can Georgia militarily get Russia out of anywhere? Uh, <laughs> What happens if they make some sort of big move? <laughs> I don't think either country wants a war. I don't think either country can afford a war. The real issue is always the unwanted war, the involuntary war, because tensions have risen for one reason or another. And you get to that incrementally, step by step, just as we did in 2008. What has happened over the last five years has been a tragedy. I never thought that I would come to this country to see this country again in war, again occupied by the Russian tanks. This war was a terrible war. But this actually strengthened us. The question has been asked, do you still have hopes that the territories that were taken and occupied by Russia will be given back to you? We are sure that this land will be ours like it has always been, and Georgia shall be victorious.
the expectation is that South Ossetia at some point is likely to be incorporated into the Russian Federation. Я подписал указы о признании Российской Федерации независимости Южной Осетии и независимости Абхазии. We have to uh, be confronted to the reality that uh, either Georgia will to do it tomorrow exist through us uh, or probably it will become a neo-colony of the big power in the region. It's sort of the nature of the beast in a funny kind of way that these violent eruptions, you know, happen in the Caucasus and everything kind of vaguely goes back to normal, but it's a dysfunctional normal. <laughs> Uh, no matter what's the world crisis, uh, we bear responsibility that it's we reverse it somehow and uh, manage to overcome that, and we will overcome. That's why we got back to the office and we said, okay, we are building this bridge here. We should make this building better. We should enlarge that square. So where are we off to today? We are going now to see a plant in the city of Kutaisi when you newly built, I mean, it's being built right now, this steel factory by with some Indian capital. I know where it's something. I wanted to drop by and see what it, what's up here. Hi, how are you? So the whole thing will come, the whole thing will come from there and then this thing can for me, it, it, it's a big thrill because this is this was the place that just was place of skeletons of old factories, and now like you are making it to alive again. Thank you. We'll do the rest. We'll bring the roads. We'll bring the infrastructure. Any other issues right now? Everything's fine. Good. Yeah. Good. Good. We'll make sure that everything stays fine. Thank you. Like with every other country facing challenge with world crisis, people couldn't care less about politics right now. It's right now all about jobs, about keeping jobs. And if you are a small country, right. small amounts of money can make lots of difference. We had this huge problem with war, of course, but the crime rate, look, I mean, we have three times less crime than in Russia. I think he knows that for the first time, uh, large segments of the Georgian population, popular as he's been before, are asking real questions about what has happened as a result of his leadership and the war. And the ideologues of the Bush administration who saw Georgia as a kind of democratic ideal to confront a decreasingly democratic and problematic Russia with has gone by the wayside. It's not at the top of the agenda anymore. I think the Obama administration doesn't know what it's Georgia policy or the Georgian component of its Russia policy is to be. The relationship between our two countries has been a lot to threaten. And what we're seeing today is the beginning of uh, new progress. The Obama administration clearly had second thoughts about what that war was all about. They know now that this was a complicated picture that Saakashvili bears responsibility. What about with Saakashvili in charge? Is he damaged goods? Well, not from a U.S. perspective. He's a democratically elected leader of Georgia. President Obama has asked us to review our policies toward both Russia and Georgia, but the foundation of those policies remains the same. Americans have a good saying, this is a son of a bitch, but this is our son of a bitch. <laughs> the Obama people are on record as saying they favor Georgia's long-term membership into NATO. But I think everybody understands, as the French would say, that's not for tomorrow. Clearly this invasion was intended to deter, scare NATO away. Uh, if NATO gets scared away, this will be a never-ending story. The Saakashvili government uh, has managed to kill uh, the NATO integration perspective very effectively through one repression and one war. You had told CNN that you think both Saakashvili should go. I still believe that. Uh, I think that uh, uh, a president who has brought uh, about uh, such a tragedy on his country uh, should not stay. Agnes <laughs> 
մուշեղովս կարտով դիասպորոստան ռուսը չի։ Մոսկովոնի դեմ դուրատ։ Georgian nation is changing the regime usually. I'm sure that very soon they'll change the regime with Saakashvili. They kick him out because this is Georgian tradition. They fall in love with their leaders and then they kick them out when they're disappointed. The most political parties in Georgia are agreed on one demand that he must resign. The Euros Revolution carried promise to the people. I think the main promise was democracy and freedom. Obviously we did make mistakes. Only those who don't act not make mistakes. But I think in general it is clear that we chose the right direction in all key points. Street rallies and peaceful demonstrations part of the institution is another way of doing politics, as we all know. And the trouble is that Saakashvili came into office on the crest of a popular wave and crowds in the street. You've unfortunately set that precedent for yourself. Every time somebody promises us, uh, you know, a doomsday scenario, there are too many people out there willing to believe it. I've been facing these ultimatums every other month for the last five years. Welcome to Georgian political scenery. We are confident about your future. You should be confident about it.